Oh. For a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentle all the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very cast that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may in little place attest a million. And let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts, and to a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we speak of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, and over times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For which supply, admit me, chorus, to this history, who prologue-like your humble patience pray. Gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. William Shakespeare's Henry V begins with an apology. An apology for the limits of theater. The story of the early 15th century English king Henry of Monmouth had been adapted before Shakespeare's day as the famous victories of Henry V, but in his adaptation, Shakespeare points out the impossibility of this specific act of stagecraft. We can't show a whole war on this stage. We can't depict the monstrosity of a battle in this space. We're just stuck here on this simple stage, this wooden O, attempting to show a great historical event. The Elizabethan stage was bare compared to modern stagecraft. Open to the air, no curtain, little separation between stage action and the audience. As you can see from this highly inaccurate model I threw together in Blender, so I've been teaching myself 3D modeling for the past year or so, and I'm still working on proper use of materials, like this is okay, but it wound up looking like something out of the original mist. But anyway, the great thing about this opening is how it speaks to Shakespeare's understanding of medium. Medium, the thing in between the artist and viewer, the thing in the middle of them. So with this opening, Henry V becomes a play about the limits of theater. A play about the impossibility of its own telling. And also, the need to tell that story in spite of it. Henry V is the ancestor of all war movies. A leader burdened by his decisions, a motley crew of selectively diverse soldiers representing the nation in miniature. Like, there's an Englishman, a Welshman, a Scotsman, and an Irishman all in the same battalion. Like, it's so, you know. And it seems like a natural choice to adapt during wartime, as Sir Laurence Olivier was encouraged to do by Winston Churchill. After all, it's a play about soldiers crossing the English Channel to fight in France. It's no accident that this movie was encouraged to be made in 1944. But still, there's that opening. That theater-specific opening. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Ironically, as time went on, that location-specific prologue made it even harder to stage Henry V. In 1613, the Globe Theatre burned down, and wouldn't be rebuilt until the 20th century. No generation since 1600 has actually had the original instrument that Shakespeare wrote for, the Globe Theatre. 
So Olivier got pretty creative. He begins with a shot of a miniature recreation of London in 1600. The camera tips down into a recreation of the Globe Theatre. And the play begins in a period accurate dish recreation of the Globe itself. And the chorus speaks. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. So when Olivier first appears, he's not playing King Henry, but an actor playing King Henry. And as the film goes on, it's moved into a studio space, with sets and costumes styled to look like a book of hours, like a medieval illustrated manuscript. And on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt itself, it's shot on location. The costumes become more period accurate, and Olivier stops playing an actor and starts playing King Henry himself. Slowly moving beyond the bounds of the theater into the new possibilities of the filmic medium. Shakespeare's chorus began the play by saying, Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. Olivier shows that with film, with a big enough budget, you don't have to imagine horses. Here they are. A huge battle in full technicolor. A blockbuster scale. Proof that even in 1944, in the United Kingdom, after years of war-draining resources, we can still stage a scene as spectacular as this. Defy the space of that wooden O, and go to the field itself, where Henry can finally stand before his thousands of troops and say, This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. <sighs> the St. Crispin's Day speech. The one that gets quoted by everyone. And we few, we happy few, we small band of brothers and girl from across the street. Everyone. Today is St. Crispin's Day. And every year from now on, you will be able to show your scars and say that you are here with me on St. Crispin's Day. Everyone. To know that the fifth is of the last one here and hold down in his tape where he picks that foot with foot. It's a great speech on its own, but it's also a fascinating counterpoint to the opening chorus. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. We in it shall be remembered. Even if this theater, this wooden O that we're in, is insufficient to tell the majesty of the story of the big war thing that the good king did. Just the fact that we're here telling this story now in this humble space, that enough is proof of victory. It's not a great wooden O, but hey, at least I made it. At least. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. It's a victory, even if we didn't actually win anything. And I need to mention that in Olivier's telling, he left out a lot. Specifically, he omitted Henry's worst traits. Traits that were left in by Kenneth Branagh in his adaptation, which is great because it gives me something that I can cut to to make my point. I yet resolves the governor of the town. This is the latest pal we will admit. For as I am a soldier, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved half-fleur 
till in her ashes she lie buried. With foul hand, defiled the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters. Your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverent heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infant spitted upon pikes! It goes on like that. In Olivier's version, he cuts it down to this. How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest parley, we'll admit. And that's it. And he also made a smaller, subtle change to the St. Crispin's Day speech. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so base. Olivier changed the line here. The original is, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. Brana kept the original line. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. What does that mean? Well, Shakespeare's using archaic definitions for the words vile and gentle. See, vile used to mean lowborn, and gentle meant highborn. To this day, we still call people with good manners gentlemen, and we still call the bad guy in every story the villain, the vile one, the person from the village, the lowborn one. Fun bit of classist etymology there. Still, the way Henry uses it is a nice sentiment. If you fight with me, your rank doesn't matter, because you're all noble. You are all my brothers, my band of brothers, my brothers in blood. Yeah, nice sentiment. It's also a lie. After the battle, Henry is given a list of the fallen, and he goes through them. Edward, the Duke of York. The Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire, and of all other men, but five and twenty score. Again, Olivier made a subtle change. Brana left in the original line. Davy Gam, Esquire, none else of name. None else of name. None else of name. None else of name. Of rank, of title, of nobility. They will not be remembered. Henry's a liar. He's a fucking liar. Um, I don't know why I'm pointing this out. I don't know what good it actually does to put this in a video. Except maybe to say, beware of pretty speeches. Beware of rhetoric without substance. Beware of leaders trying to inspire you to act against your own interest and in theirs. I mean... They're only pretty speeches. Then again, it is comforting when living through difficult times, knowing that even if the story we tell decays, the story will be told. Some part will be remembered as long as people tell it. And I think that's why the Christmas Day speech is so inspiring because of how it frames victory. The victory isn't in how much blood we'll spill or what lands we'll conquer or how, our, how history will be changed. The victory is simply in the telling, which begs the question, how are we going to tell it? Let there be sung non nobis and te deum. The dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais and to England then, where ne'er from France arrived more happier men. <laughs> 